They raised that child, mm -hmm. and then that child left the home mm -hmm. and never even sent a Christmas card for mm -hmm. the, the next 20 years. And mm -hmm. the clients, they didn't want to leave them any money, and they have that right. Wow. Wow. So if you're an adopted child, you still have to be a, a nice child to your parents, <laughs> or you could get disinherited. <laughs> That's amazing. We hear about private foundation. Could you tell us a little bit more about it? What is sure. it? Well, we've all heard about the big foundations, like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, or the Ford Foundation, the Carnegie Foundation, um, formed by Andy Andrew Carnegie, the, the mm -hmm. steel magnate, and the Warren Buffett Foundation. Those are very large tax-exempt organizations. They're called 501c3 tax-exempt organizations. And they do great things for our community, for our world, for our children, for our universities and libraries. Mm -hmm. um, but on a, on a smaller level, for everyday people like you and me, um, many people form private foundations. They're less than a million dollars in value. And the, the, by the way, there's no de minimis amount. You can form a foundation with a hundred dollars. I was going to say our church is a 501. Yeah, so church, yeah. churches are tax-exempt organizations. Uh -huh. That's right. Okay. And the basic thing is they don't pay regular income taxes. Mm -hmm. So if you have, let's say you have a home, a, a second home, or a duplex, or some sort of an asset that you want to mm -hmm. sell, you could form a foundation, your own private foundation. You could be the director you can contribute that building or that asset to your own foundation and then sell it and you don't have to pay any capital gains taxes or income taxes. Now after the sale you've got a lot of money left over, well hopefully you've got a lot of money <laughs> left over in your foundation and you invest that money and then the foundation it has an obligation because remember it is a charitable organization, right? Mm -hmm. So it has to spend five percent each year in charitable related activities. So if you have a private foundation you pick the charitable purpose and it can be anything that you want that's approved by the IRS that's charitable. You can form a foundation that would be a scholarship organization, medical research, uh, environmental protection, athletics, helping the poor, helping a church, um, tsunami and disaster relief. There's so many different kinds of foundations. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can put a property or a few thousand dollars into the foundation and then you spend 5% per year as a minimum helping further the charitable purpose that you've selected. Very interesting. We do, yeah, yeah. children and the homeless. And Wow, you are smart. Let's see. So this is great. <laughs> well, I've done a lot of these, so you know, <laughs> practice makes perfect. <laughs> then, okay, can you tell us about the new federal estate tax? Since we are talking about the private foundation, how? Yes, yes, <laughs> I, I'd be happy to. Um, in December of last year, of 2010, Congress, at the final hour, finally passed a new estate tax law. So, first of all, the, the estate tax is quite different from other taxes. It's, it's not like the income tax or sales tax or capital gains tax or property taxes. The estate tax hits a person's estate after they die. Mm -hmm. And it has to be paid within nine months after the person dies. If the net value of their assets is greater than the maximum applicable exclusion amount, or, or we say the estate tax exemption mm -hmm. amount. So the new estate tax exemption, as per Congress um, in December, for the years 2011 and 2012 mm -hmm. per person is $5 million. They increased it from where it was in 2009. The most you could leave your loved ones in 2009 was $3.5 million. Now that's a lot of money for, for most people. Mm -hmm. And that amount has now been increased to $5 million per spouse. Mm -hmm. So when you have a couple, a husband and a wife, it's $5 million for the husband, $5 million for the wife. That's a total of $10 million that can be passed to, to the children uh, or grandchildren. 
as a gen you can even generation skip to grandchildren or great grandchildren and and pass up up to ten million dollars um, without estate wow. tax. However, and this is the clincher. That sounds pretty good, right? Because most yeah. Americans have less than ten million dollars. <laughs> so most people are thinking, "Wow, this is great. I'm never going to have to pay estate taxes." But under the new congressional law, that five million dollar limit drops to only one million dollars mm -hmm. in 2013, oh. which is not nearly as much. And many California residents and people with uh, valuable homes and businesses. He's talking to you. Are going to be. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at both of you. <laughs> I'm still trying to get the estate. Okay. <laughs> but this is very interesting. Yeah. So, so it's only a million dollars per person that can be passed after 2013. So unless a person plans on dying in the next two years, they've really got to do. A, uh, I hope that doesn't apply no. to anybody I in this room. <laughs> um, they've really got to do a lot of planning. And, and look at ways to transfer wealth um, while they can during the next two years while the gift limit is, is so high. Wow. Mm. Okay, um, I want to know if someone has an estate plan, should it be reviewed? Because we were talking about that. Is, is it all set up and then you go bye bye? Or should it be reviewed? Yeah, because that's what most people do. They, they get the <laughs> will done or they get the living trust done mm -hmm. and they put it on the shelf right. and they let it gather dust. Right. Um, <laughs> but, no, I think you're right, Wanda. I think uh, whenever you have an estate plan, mm -hmm. I recommend to my clients every three to four years mm -hmm. that they get it out of the closet, blow the dust off, yeah. and bring it into the lawyer's office and review it. Mm -hmm. Make sure you still know and love all those people that you've <laughs> named. Uh, make sure that your successor trustee, like we were talking about, still is in town and you still trust them and you still like them. And, right. and above all, make sure it's compliant with the law because mm -hmm. the laws are always changing and you need to review the documents on a regular basis to make sure they're always up to date. We're really fortunate to have you on this show. Um, okay, so Mr. Hales, I guess my question would be, how does a person go about getting an estate plan done? Well, some people try to do it on their own, mm -hmm. but I think that's a mistake because when you create a proper estate plan, it should have a living trust, okay. a pour over will, durable powers of attorney for financial management, advanced health care directives, asset assignment forms, and grant deeds have to actually transfer your property into, into the trust. So to get all this done, a person really should find an estate planning attorney someone that specializes in, in estate planning law, someone with experience, they should call up the law firm, ask the lawyer if they can get a complimentary consultation. Okay. To go in and meet the lawyer, see if they like them, see if the lawyer is creative and, and able to answer their questions and solve their problems. And if they have a good comfort level with the lawyer, um, then they can work closely with him or her and, and get their estate planning documents done. All right. Oh, well. What are the mistakes people do when planning a state? Well, I think the number one mistake is they don't do any planning. Mm -hmm. I mean, most Americans still um, don't have anything more than a will. In fact, most Americans don't even have a will um, or a trust. But um, I think one big mistake is people try to do the planning themselves. Uh, they, they go on to... Um, internet uh, programs and try to download documents and it, it is a skill, it is an art and, and I think uh, an attorney, uh, uh, an experienced estate planning attorney can help avoid those mistakes. I see. Well, uh, there are a lot of other mistakes that people make too but, but I think that's uh, the, the biggest one is just trying to do it on their own. Yeah. Well I think what's going to happen is that now that I know that I can actually have an estate, because I didn't know that, <laughs> and I'm impressed that it only has to be over a hundred thousand dollars. That's correct. See, I learned a lot of stuff. So, so I know that an estate is something that's over a hundred thousand dollars, and uh, the difference between a will and a trust, and um, let's see, and you don't have to be like Donald Trump to have an estate plan. No, you don't. Okay, so a good planning. <laughs> you just have to want to organize whatever it is you have. You uh -huh. know, whatever 
your estate consists of, uh, you just want to get it organized to, to achieve that peace of mind. I think that's the real goal of estate planning is so that people have a peace of mind. They, they know that if they're gone that everything's going to be taken care of and people won't be fighting and confused and assets won't be lost. How about personal items like rings, jewelry, and you want to leave to your kids or does that go under a will or a trust? Well, it can go under either, but when we make a trust for a client, because remember the trust doesn't go through probate. Mm -hmm. So what we usually recommend is that when you have a trust, you also have a list of personal items mm -hmm. and it can describe, describe the ring and who the ring goes to and who the watch or who, the, who an automobile goes to. Mm -hmm. So you should actually have a list attached to the trust or it can be part of a will describing who gets what. And then you should just maintain that and maybe revise it every so often. I mean, some people just get a piece of tape and they write a grandchild's name on it and then they stick the tape under the item. Uh, that's another way to do it. <laughs> but the only Is problem... Is that acceptable though by probate court? Well, and anybody can stick a tape on. That's it. right, and people can move the tape around. Like right, take the tape yeah. off the grand piano and put it on it. You know, so put I my name on it. Exactly. <laughs> that can be problematic. Yeah. But to the extent that uh, it's being administered by the trustee mm -hmm. under a trust, it's okay. A probate court wouldn't like that because a probate court wants to organize and value and and control everything, make sure it's fair. But with the trust, it's a little more flexible and you could probably use a, a tape method if you wanted to. Now we have one minute to go, so we're gonna be wrapping this up for just on this segment. Uh, our next segment, we're gonna discuss prenups and postnups, so I'm excited about that. I, I do have a question. Because all of this is so much money and you're going with uh, your children, your spouse, um, the person who's handling it, what kind of ethics do you guys have to have or, I mean, you know, you want somebody ethical. So do you have to go to classes? Is there something I could look for when looking for an attorney? Well, yes. Um, number one, you want to be sure that that lawyer is licensed. Okay. You want to check, go on the internet, check their bar record, okay. and then specifically question them about their experience in probate and trusts. Beautiful. Thank you for joining us today from the Halls of Justice, and I hope you enjoyed the show. We will see you again next week, and once again, we're going to be talking about prenups, postnups, and uh, we're going to pick your brain. Thank you. We will see you next week. Mervette, thank you so much for coming You're up welcome. with us. Thank, thank you, Mr. Thank you. <laughs>